I welcome you to St. James King Street on this fifth Sunday after Epiphany. It is our great joy today to welcome back into our midst uh, Deacon Christopher Waterhouse, who is also our guest preacher. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Today we mark the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She is the longest serving British monarch and Queen of Australia, becoming Queen in 1952 at the age of 25. We have given thanks for her de dedication and service over these 70 years while last April we mourned with her the death of her consort, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Her Majesty has been an exemplar of faithful devotion to God and commitment to her calling. God save the Queen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, the Son of God, has been revealed as a light to the nations. Let us bring our darkness to his light, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
let us pray. Most holy God, in whose presence angels serve in all, and whose glory fills all heaven and earth, cleanse our unclean lips and transform us by your grace, so that your word spoken through us may bring many to your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. For the word of the Lord.
A reading from the first book of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what it was in turn that I had received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Kephas then to the twelve then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time most of whom are still alive though some have died Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as of someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. That was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. For the word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water, and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have been working all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish, that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. For the Gospel of the Lord. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, yet shalt thou refresh me. Thy right hand shall save me. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. First, can I say how glad I am to be here, to be with you in person this morning, and online too. I've been on the other end of this for a while joining you on Sunday afternoons from time to time when I got home from the cathedral. My thanks particularly to Father Andrew and to Father John for your welcome and your warm hospitality this week. It's been 12 months since I saw you last face to face with a year that's been marked by lockdowns, border restrictions, and a good deal of uncertainty. 
But it's also been a year of progress, of establishment, of personal and spiritual growth. I've spent my first year as a deacon in the service of God and of his church and also finishing my master's. One of the most interesting aspects of my year has not been the grand occasions, but just the incidental conversations that happen from time to time. A clerical collar is something of a beacon. A lady told me in a conversation on the steps of St. David's Cathedral in Hobart the other day that she thought I was very brave to be putting myself forward for ordination to the priesthood. Why did she think I was brave, I wondered. I wonder if it's because the church is no longer the loving, hopeful, respected institution that it once was. It is generally seen with suspicion and contempt. Is it any wonder? All we seem to hear from the church is a message of exclusion and hatred of badly formed policy, knee-jerk public comment, and bigotry masquerading as faith. None of this is what we are called to as the church. And it will get us nowhere. It will not fill our nets or our boats. It will not grow the kingdom. It does not honor him. It does not form new disciples in the faith. A quick look through the readings we've just heard this morning. We see the frailty of the human condition, our brokenness, our fragility, our unworthiness to call ourselves people of God. The prophet Isaiah says, woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. St. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, says, I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. What happens when it's persecuted from the inside? And then in the gospel we've just read, Simon Peter says to Jesus, Go away from me, Lord for I am a sinful man. It's a bit of a bleak picture, but God does not leave us there. The Lord says to us, do not be afraid. Despite all this, God has saved us through his Son. We can stand as a people rescued from our sin. My diaconal year has been marked by three words. Humility, service, and love. And it's a struggle because it's not in our nature to be humble. It's not in our nature to put ourselves last and the needs of others and the divine plans of Almighty God before our own. It's not in our nature to love those we find it difficult to love. Humanity is very good at finding reasons to hate. As Christians, we must reject this. Discernment of the spiritual life, lived in accordance with the commands of God, and true to Christ's command for us to love one another as he himself has loved us, draws us to set aside our hatred and our differences. Christ is the one who unites we must ask God to heal us and forgive us, to forgive us our hatred, our greed, our selfish desires, our sins. And in asking, we should be confident that God will hear us and will indeed forgive us. So it leads me to consider what part forgiveness plays in all of this. At the end of last year, I submitted my master's thesis and I took an enormous breath and gave a sigh. It might have been a sigh of relief, 
and I think it was, but it wasn't so much relief that it was finished. Rather, it was relief that I had stumbled upon something. It was relief to have discovered something in my studies that brought everything into sharp focus for me personally and has given me a fresh insight into what I think it means to live as a follower of Christ. I chose to write my thesis on the mission and ministry of the Community of the Cross of Nails, the CCN, a worldwide network of 200 churches and other member organizations committed to the work of forgiveness and reconciliation. It was founded by Coventry Cathedral, its symbol, the famous cross of three nails, formed from the nails found in the rubble of Coventry's medieval cathedral, which was bombed during the Second World War. I chose the subject because my mother's side of the family are from Coventry, and because St. David's Cathedral, where I now minister in Hobart, is the only Australian member church of the community of the Cross of Nails. Seems reasonable enough, doesn't it? I go into my research with a question, therefore, about what membership of the CCN might mean in the 21st century in an Australian context. Is it any use to us, I asked? Could we be making more of our association? Are there resources that we could be drawing on to help us in our ministry? Or is it time to cut the ties and just leave it be? I did have a grave concern, and that is that the story of Coventry can and often does dominate the story and ministry of the CCN. Whenever you start to tell the story of the bombing of the cathedral, the community of the Cross of Nails can start to feel like it belongs only in Coventry, that its story is too tightly connected to the story of the war, and therefore it's simply a relic of history. And you know, to some extent, that is partly true. Coventry's story is famous and compelling, therefore it gets your attention. But it's not just a war story. It's not just the story of one English city. Coventry's example, Coventry's teaching, Coventry's ministry speaks of a universality, a lesson for all of us around the world. Therefore, there is a potency to the community of the Cross of Nails, and it's got nothing to do with blame or guilt. It's got everything to do with forgiveness and healing. In my research, I studied the work and ministry of three key Christian leaders in Europe in the 1930s. They were the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, his friend, the English Bishop of Chichester, George Bell, and the little-known Dean of Coventry Cathedral, Provost Richard Howard. Provost, an ancient name for Dean. All three of these men were committed to Christian unity and ecumenism. All three were deeply concerned by the hatred which seemed to permeate society, which was used to justify the horrors of war. All three men stood up and spoke out with a profoundly Christian message against the dominant political and social voices of the time, and each of them took a great personal risk in doing so. George Bell, for his part, stood in the floor of the British Parliament to lecture them against the blanket bombing of German towns. Bonhoeffer was concerned with the dignity of all human people, regardless of race or status. He knew that many people in Germany absolutely opposed the Nazi regime. He himself was involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Bonhoeffer was arrested, imprisoned, and assassinated himself just before the end of the war. Before his death, he had advocated for Christian unity. He wanted churches and nations to work together, regardless of race, regardless of church politics or denomination. And why? Because by working together, unified by Christ, he believed, 
that the church could bring about true peace and true healing to a hurting world. Fortunately, his cause was taken up after the war by his friend, Bishop George Bell in England, who traveled to Germany several times in an act of Christian friendship and reconciliation. He was a passionate ecumenist, concerned not with internal church politics, but the unity of all Christian people, working to speak and act in love in a world full of hate. And what about Coventry? In Coventry, Provost Howard was living out these same ideals as early as 1940, just six weeks after his cathedral had been bombed and ruined. He stood in the old building on Christmas Day and gave a radio broadcast on the BBC. You might well have expected him to give a speech about retaliation, about strength, about righteous action to right the wrongs that had been done to the city and its cathedral. But he didn't say anything like that at all. Instead, he spoke about Christian hope, forgiveness, and reconciliation. In 1940, in the ruins of his bombed-out cathedral, what he said was this, what we want to tell the world is this, that with Christ, born again in our hearts today, we are trying, hard as it may be, to banish all thoughts of revenge. We are bracing ourselves to finish this tremendous job of saving the world from tyranny and cruelty. We are going to try to make a kinder, simpler, more Christ-like sort of world in the days beyond this strife. I argued in my thesis that the community of the Cross of Nails attempts to live out that hope. After the war, Howard himself went straight to Germany. He took with him a cross fashioned out of the roof nails of his ruined cathedral. And he presented the cross as a symbol of the commitment to kindness, to forgiveness, to the work of rebuilding and reconciliation. The first cross of nails, the first partnership which has now become a global movement. So inspired by Provost Howard's teaching and after the example of Christ himself, a litany has been written and is used. It's known as the Coventry Litany of Reconciliation. You may well know it. You may well have prayed it. It's prayed every Friday in the ruins of the old St. Michael's Cathedral in Coventry. And likewise, it's prayed and used by member churches and organizations all around the world. As I studied it, I realized that there was a striking similarity to the words of the Coventry Litany and the words spoken in another radio broadcast by Bishop George Bell to the people of Germany in 1945. I was already aware of his work because while I was in Oxford, a small quote of that broadcast was etched into the stone of a side chapel set aside for the Ministry of Peace and Reconciliation. The chapel bears his name. I'd never read the full quote until I went digging. This is what I discovered. This isn't the whole broadcast. But he said, we all have to recognize that we have fallen short of the right standards of conduct to other people. We all have to repent. No nation, no church, no individual is guiltless. And as we would be forgiven ourselves, we must also be forgiving. Without repentance and without forgiveness, there can be no regeneration. That's as potent today as it was then. And I discovered remarkably similar to the words of the Coventry Litany of Reconciliation. It begins, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God goes on to ask for God's forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done. It ends, 
Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Each stanza of the Coventry Litany asks God for forgiveness. The words, though, are not, Father, forgive them, or Father, forgive us, but simply, Father, forgive. All have fallen short. This is no time for pointing the finger at the sinfulness and wickedness of others. Instead, we must begin our work of reconciliation of humankind to itself after the pattern of Christ who reconciled humanity to God through his death and resurrection, saving us from our sin and our wickedness and commanding us to love. Because of him we may have life. We are not condemned. We are forgiven. My goodness, what would it mean if we truly lived our lives as a forgiven and forgiving people, what would that mean for our world, which seems so intent on hatred, destruction, and hostility? What would it mean for a church that seems to be so intent on tearing itself apart? The community of the Cross of Nails throughout the world is built around three guiding principles, which I think we could all learn from and use, member church or not. The guiding principles are to heal the wounds of history, to learn to love, to live with difference, and to celebrate diversity, and to build a culture of peace. We can all do that. Indeed, we must whether we are healing wounds in our society, in our workplace, or within our family, whether we are learning to live with difference of age, race, creed, sexual orientation, or religion, whether we are building a culture of peace in the world or in our own backyard, surely we could all start to put the lesson of Coventry to use today. What a profound insight from Provost Richard Howard. And yet, no one knows his story. You won't find his name in the long list of the heroes of the faith that we remember in the church's calendar. Bonhoeffer is there. Bishop Bell is there. But not Provost Howard. What a pity. What a remarkable man. I wish I'd met him. As I ended my thesis, I suddenly realized something. My family did know Provost Howard. My grandparents regularly attended the cathedral. They would have heard him preach. They would have received the sacrament from him. And that's when I caught my breath. It was Provost Howard who influenced my grandparents for the rest of their lives. Is it any wonder that their Christian love and example inspired me so much? Goodness, we need a Provost Howard in the church today. And look, while none of us met him, we can all be inspired by his wisdom by his clarity, by his conviction, and his love. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen.
let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. O oh God, your glory fills the heavens, yet you answer your people when they call on you. Hear our prayers for the world and for the church. We pray for your world in need of your gospel of peace and justice. We pray for victims of conflict, exploitation and greed for those who suffer from famine, drought or disease, and particularly those in Yemen and Myanmar, for leaders of nations and for all who struggle to make a more just society. Your gospel gives us hope to leave behind all that divides nation from nation, Give us grace to believe and tell this good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church in need of your spirit of freedom and truth. We pray for leaders of churches, theologians and teachers, and particularly the Church of Ireland for members of councils and synods of the church, for this parish and all who minister. And on the sixth day of each month, we pray for the Diocese of Bendigo, its bishop, clergy and people, We pray for Government House, our State Governor, and all those who work and support the duties. And in the parish, we pray for the Executive Committee, which is the Rector and the three Church Wardens and the Archivists. Your Gospel sets us free to leave behind the rigidity of law and tradition. Give us grace to believe and tell this good news. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer, those in need of your spirit of acceptance and healing. For those afraid for the present, and without hope for the future, 
for those for whom each day is a struggle to survive. And for those whose lives are filled with loneliness, grief and pain. And for those in need, Nicholas Lee, Carla and James, Christine Kate and Julia Collis, Nadira Al Araj, and the sick, Joan Elliston, Joyce Smith, Johan Nell, Father Richard Aldersley, Ruth Jones, Anne Ryan, Amy Horsborough, Graham Cooksley, David Cheatham, Badly Anita, Olivia Peck, David, Kath Marriott, Campbell Wharton, Robin Hobbs, Elliot, John Gillam, Francis Rolfe, Father Lance Johnston, Sister Jeanette Fox, Peter Remwick, Barbara Joan Rothery. Your gospel gives us strength to leave behind rejection, failure, and fear. Give us grace to believe and tell this good news. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all who have died in your love and who, with all the host of heaven, sing your praise. And the recently departed, Merle Newell, June Godfrey, Ashley Ball, Alicia Lysanenko. We give you thanks for all who have heard and answered your call, all who have drawn others to you. Give us faith to leave all and follow you, to say with all your saints, here am I, send me. Your gospel challenges us to leave death and choose life. Give us grace to believe and tell this good news. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. And through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. To glory and honor be yours always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise. For your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. You anointed him as Messiah, the light of the nations, and revealed him as the hope of all who thirst for righteousness and peace. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of them, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing.
merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, for this bread and this wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and his blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is God. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. His mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. With whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains, which have been gathered together and made one bread, so, so may your church be gathered, gathered from, from the ends, ends of the earth, earth into your kingdom. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord I, am I am not worthy, worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I, I shall be healed.
God of the nations, we thank you for nourishing us with this holy sacrament. Guide us by your presence, that we may bring your light to those who dwell in darkness and establish your justice in the earth. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love, both thankfully and with courage, in the power of your spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated? like getting the results of Eurovision. We welcome those who have joined us for worship today and especially those who have joined us online. Today at four o'clock we will have a special service of choral evensong to mark the 70th anniversary of the Queen's accession. Our guests of honour will be Her Excellency the Governor and Mr Dennis Wilson and the preacher will be Bishop Richard Herford. This week uh, on Monday, uh, there's a Q&A session about the work of Trinity College and its involvement here in Sydney. It's at 9.15 on Zoom and details are in the pew sheet. Please also note that on Wednesdays from now on, our lunchtime concerts and choral evensongs have recommenced, including the live streaming of Coral Evensong. This Saturday at 10 o'clock, the St James Institute is conducting a seminar on social justice in the Gospel of Luke, and the speaker will be Canon Bob Darrenbacker, the Dean of Trinity College, Melbourne. Uh, he will also be our guest preacher next Sunday, uh, and in the following week, uh, the college will be conducting an intensive course here at St James. Also next Sunday at 11.30, we will be immuring the ashes of James Jarvie uh, in the columbarium, and it will be after the 10 a.m. Eucharist. The National Church Life Survey, today is the last opportunity to complete it and hand it in. Uh, copies are in the baptistry. It only takes about 15 minutes to complete, and there's a place where you can leave it uh, when you've finished, or you can do it online, and details about that are in the pew sheet. Uh, today we've uh, brought out the latest edition of St James Connections. If you didn't get one as you arrived, there are plenty available. You can take additional ones uh, to give to friends and people who are not able to be here today. Well, something you may have missed, but it's in the pew sheet. But we congratulate Dr Rosalie Pocket for receiving the medal for the Order of Australia uh, in the recent uh, honours list. <laughs> and now I hand over to our Director of the Institute, Dr Aaron Galoni, to launch their season for this year. It is a pleasure to launch the St. James Institute's 2022 season. Perhaps you've already had a chance to peek at the program book. Notice a few things about the 2022 season. First, some complex issues. Cancer, Anglican disagreement, Islamophobia, domestic violence, the Holocaust. We're taking a deep breath and facing difficult realities. But second, notice expertise. We're not facing these matters naively. The Institute is blessed to attract some of the best thinkers and communicators working in the area of religion, spirituality, and culture. Third, notice diversity of presenters. Our program is not just a roster of white men. There is strong gender parity and a growing 
racial diversity amongst our speakers. Fourth, notice beauty. Our 22, 2022 sessions offer opportunities to explore poetry, art, spirituality. And fifth, practicality. The program provides useful, real-world help in facing aging, end-of-life care, domestic violence, prayer. In short, the program has been created in order to help us grow in our adulthood. The St. James Institute approaches faith in a rational, inclusive, informed, and respectful way. An adult way. And I'm pleased to say the Institute has strong encouragement from you, the wonderful people of St. James. Indeed, many parishioners have already subscribed uh, online, and I thank you for that. If you haven't, the Institute team will be selling subscriptions on the patio today after the service. Uh, subscribing is a simple and quick process, and an annual subscription is a savings of over 50% on single event tickets. And even more, a subscription is a way of supporting this unique adult education ministry. Even if you can't get along to many events, subscribing is a way of saying, I believe in the work the Institute does here in Sydney. And, and notice one final thing about the 2022 program. And in saying this, I want to acknowledge the good work of the former Institute Director, Reverend Christian for Waterhouse, in paving the way for this. And that is Trinity in Sydney. This year, we enter a partnership with Trinity College in Melbourne. This partnership provides tertiary theological education from a classical Anglican perspective. Their classes are accessible to laity and are taught by a faculty renowned for its expertise in biblical studies and theology. Plus, Institute subscribers receive a $100 discount on each Trinity intensive they audit. So please support this work. We look forward to saying hi after the service. Uh, there's, there's baskets of chocolates there, so if nothing else, stop by and grab a handful of sweets. And with that, I declare the St. James Institute's 2022 season officially launched. Thank you. Would you please stand?
May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest to you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.